Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for, again, an opportunity to sit in your holy presence to receive your holy word. We pray, Lord, that our hearts will be good soil, that the good seed of your word is planted in, that will then produce fruit that you are pleased with. We confess and repent of our sin, O Lord, and ask that you will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let your word have your way this day, O Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Following the next song, you will receive the inspirational word of God today from Minister Simeon Dawson. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Today, our scripture text will be coming from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. I have quite a few verses, and I'll try to read quickly. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And Ahab, verse 1 says, And Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done. And with all, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Verse 2, Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not my life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, Jezebel was letting Elijah know that she didn't like the idea of him killing the prophets. And she was certainly letting him know how she felt about it. And let me give you a hint how she felt. She sort of felt a little bit like Aretha Franklin. She, she was letting him know, you better think about what you're trying to do to me. Verse 3 says, and when he saw that, in other words, Elijah saw how serious Jezebel was. He saw that he arose and he went for his life. Oh, he didn't go on vacation. He was running for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongeth unto Jordan, to Judah, and left his servant there. He left everybody, y'all. Verse 4 says, but he went, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. There it is right there in the text. Another day's journey. Well, except Elijah wasn't glad about it. He, he was running. And he went into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested. Oh, it's, it's quite odd that you request for himself that he would die. And said, it is enough now, O Lord. Elijah was saying, Lord, that's, that's enough of this now. O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my fathers. Verse 5 says, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. I just want to point out quickly the symbolism of the tree that he was sitting under. The juniper tree symbolized safety. It symbolized keeping people safe. It was a sign of strength, power, and divinity. So Elijah thought that he was running away, but he was running right into the safe hands of the Lord God Almighty. Verse 6 says, And he looked and beheld that there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and he laid down again. Now, let me just add a little information in here. Now, we, are, we shouldn't be. We know better than eating and laying down. Verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Now, this is the second time. It's like a mother or a father telling you to get up. A boy did not tell you to get up. This is the second time I came over here. Now, you better get up, because the journey is too great for you. Verse 8, and he arose. He finally decided to take responsibility, y'all, from the Sunday school lesson. And he arose. Yes, he did. He arose, and he did eat. 
What happened? He arose and did eat. And he drank and went, verse 8, in the strip of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto all of the mount of God. Verse 9, and came thither unto a cave and lodged, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, what doest thou here? Elijah, in other words, Elijah, what are you doing way out here all along? Don't you know I am where you are? You didn't have to come out here. I I was going to be where you are. Verse 10 says, and he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord. Now, isn't it good to serve a God who will listen to what you have to say? He's not so power struck and so awestruck that he can't listen to his sheep. And he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thine prophets with the sword. And I, even I, and left, and they seek my life. In other words, he said, I'm the only one left. And that's the final verse. I'm the only one left to take it away. And further, guys, in beyond verse 10, I'm going to stop there, but beyond verse 10, God later gave him a few teaching exercises to show him that he needed not to count on mind-capturing events, but he needed to seek God's still, small voice. God did not rebuke him, but he sent him back on his journey along with a new assignment. Now I want to take my text quickly from verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for thee. Now Elijah went all out by himself, y'all, and he, he was ready to end and ready for it to be over, but God met him where he was. And my topic today is God's power to intervene. God's power to intervene. Intervene means to come between so as to prevent or alter a result of a course of actions or events. It means to interfere with something so as to stop it, to settle it, or to simply change it. It means to jump in the middle of it, of something. How many of you have ever jumped in the middle of a fight? It means to get involved. Elijah had dealt with those who had opposed God's covenant. Again, we're talking about God's power to intervene. The prophets of Baal had pushed him as far as he could go. Now, he was mad for a good reason, y'all. Elijah simply could not handle the idea of his own God being rejected. The prophets of Baal promoted their God, and Elijah had enough audacity to promote his God, the one true God. Some may feel that Elijah took matters into his own hands by killing or slaying the prophets of Baal. Elijah did everything in his own power to stop the foolery and the madness of celebrating and believing in another God. He could not fathom nor understand how the people of Israel could turn their backs on such a God. There was approximately 450 prophets of Baal, and in addition, there were 400 more other prophets in whom Elijah met to perform a sacrificial contest. After the results of the altar sacrifices, Elijah said, now you decide who's the one true God. Sometimes you have to believe it, and this is the exact place where Elijah had his audience. And sometimes you have to see it to believe it because Elijah knew who his God was and he knew God's power. No doubt he said, I want you to see it for yourself. Don't take my word, but believe in the demonstration of God's power. Now, when it was discovered that Elijah slayed the prophets, He had to flee for his life. Not only did he run for his life, but he lost his passion to live, and he wanted to die. And Jezebel put him on a serious run. And between Elijah being in a mental mess and Jezebel with her controlling spirit, y'all, we call that a hot mess dot com. Clearly, God met Elijah where he was. 
His first step of intervention, now we're still talking about God's power to intervene. God's first step of intervention was to feed him and nourish him. Why? Because our physical bodies need the stamina and energy to carry out God's work and God's plan for our lives. God jumped in the middle of Elijah's situation. He didn't stand back as a spectator, but he intervened to abort Elijah's plan of giving up. Note that Elijah was seemingly tired and angry, but he was also in fear and depression. All of these emotions began to take a toll on his physical nature and his own will to live. Elijah, yes, he was on the run, but let me remind you that if it had not been for God who was on our side, when men rose up against us, when life circumstances tied our hands behind our back, when the doctor shook his head and called for the family and declared it was too late for God's miraculous intervention, when the, when the power looked like, at, look at, when things looked at you and boldly declare to you that everything in his his power uh, was going to get rid of you. When your supervisor looked at you and boldly declared to do everything in his power to get rid of you. When all of a sudden you just got tired along the way and just didn't want to be bothered anymore. When we prefer being left alone, when mental stress and anguish cause you undue stress and undue worry and, and undue pain, if it had not been for God, these things would have swallowed us up, taken our will to live, and left us in our personal wilderness to die. But I want to tell you, God will intervene. He'll jump in the middle of your situation just in time. He'll remove the stress and call you blessed. He'll take away the pain and declare that the Lord reigns. He will intervene when you want to walk away. When you want to throw in the towel, he'll intervene when others don't think much of you. He'll intervene when you didn't have any idea that he was working in your favor. I want to tell you God has the power to turn it around. We're talking about God's power to intervene. And as I come to the close, he has the power to make the crooked places straight. And most of all, he has the power to help you on your way. You'll find yourself saying, millions didn't make it, but I was one of the ones who did it. When he intervenes, he'll set a fire down in your soul that you can't contain and you can't control, church. Just like today on the day of Pentecost, he intervened on behalf of the people and on behalf of the apostles, and he sent his power from on high. He'll do it again and again and again. Why? Because he has the power to intervene. He has the power to stop Satan in his tracks and back him off and tell him to leave us alone. He sent his son to intervene on behalf of sin, and he'll restore you and nourish you and put you back on your journey to live for him. Why? Because of his power to intervene. May God bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God's power to intervene. Reverend Tyner.